So uh, when I started out looking at the uh, engineering of the roads, uh, working in Manhattan, there is an institute, you'll see the information at the end of the presentation. It was formed in 1785, and it's a guild, a tradesman's council, and it was um, the normal suspects, carpenters, you know, the plumbers, but also saddle makers. It was 25 trades that had a guild system that required you to become an apprentice and a juryman in order to uh, uh, practice your trade. So I went down there, and um, it, it's magnificent. It's right off Fifth Avenue, and when you walk in, there is nothing but the wonderful aroma of decaying organic matter. <laughs> the library books are just, forget acid-free paper, they are just disintegrating on the shelves. And, and it's a magnificent domed area and uh, no computers. You have to go to a card catalog. And they bring you the books from the stacks. <laughs> And so I went there and I wanted to research uh, engineering, road, you know, civil engineering books on road building from the late 1800s. And the woman brought down the three volumes and made me put on the white linen gloves and then brought me a spine thing so you could break the spine. And that worked for about an hour and then I realized this is not gonna work. I can't spend my life here doing this. So I figured, well, you know, in the interest of uh, mankind, I'll just Google and see if I can buy one of these books at a reasonable price. <laughs> and what shows up? I don't know if you're familiar with the, the, the Google print program, but all three books have been totally digitized, made available online for download. And it was just an incredible experience to suddenly have access to these uh, engineering manuals from the 1880s at your fingertips. It was wonderful. So, uh, yeah, my, my wife is from the area. Uh, her father uh, worked the railroad during the day and during, uh, or, uh, during the day, and then at night he raised 40 acres of tomatoes to sell the Campbell soup down in Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we're going uh, from footpaths to interstates. I apologize to the people from the Historical Society when they were in the book room about stealing the same words they use. Uh, but, we're, you know, it's really interesting because, as, as uh, Michael said, we've gone from necessity. Why do we move? Why do we walk down 10 feet and then 20 feet, 30 feet? Why do we end up building roads? And uh, as a sidebar conversation, when I was in grad school, I took a course on the development of trade with England after the Re Revolutionary War. And so we went up to Boston and we came back and we stopped at custom houses and so on and so forth. And I told the professor I wasn't interested in writing a paper on his particular, could I write one on the development of roads? And so here's my money tip of the week, folks. Look at a map and find two major points of population and buy land halfway in between. <laughs> because I started looking at the foundings, and I think as, as you, I mean, I, I envy you and you're, you're driving. I mean, it's incredible. But uh, I think there's human nature to start off saying, I'm going to push myself and go as far as I can. And I'll, and I'll drive 16 hours to make it. And then as we get a little older or we get married, some, some wisdom comes into it and they go, you know, I think I'm gonna stop halfway in between for the night. <laughs> but if you, look at, if you look at New York City and Albany, and then you get Poughkeepsie in between and, and uh, Newburgh. And so I started plotting the development of these towns and it just seemed that major population centers, originally people went as far as they could and then they wanted a little more comfort on the trip. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and we talked about exactly this topic here where um, that's a, a local trail here in New Jersey, the original Indian trail, and then we follow it up with the, uh, you know, one of our famous uh, mix masters. <laughs> so we need, we need to walk somewhere. One of the other things, and I, I guess I was just totally naive about it when I was uh, doing my research on roads, my parents always talked about, you know, so-and-so's on the war path. <laughs> I didn't know there were really war paths. <laughs> and typically, they would be auxiliary paths parallel to the main road so the guys could hide out and then jump out of nowhere and go, hey, give me your money, give me your life. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of it. So we, you know, we, we need to move. Hunting, food, water. Uh, this is uh, our area in here. Um, we've got Elizabeth, Westfield, Plainfield, Boundbrook, and 
you know, it's the west of where we are now, but uh, goes across the river where we were yesterday, north of where we were. Here's Trenton. But that was the primary native um, settlers in the area. And I thought that was really great. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Maybe that's what we need for publicity. <laughs> Put one of those on the road. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love it. As some of you know, I, I'm an engineer and it's really amazing to me because we'll go into a project meeting to start and we're talking to the architect and, and, and um, it, it's really interesting because how do we don't, it's the 21st century and we don't know how to design buildings. Because if you need a new corporate headquarters, what do you do? Everybody at the C level executive suites hires somebody to make a cost estimate. And then you go to the board and you get approval. Then you start designing the building and find out that you need another $30 million you hadn't planned on. So we had this term from the space program called value engineering. <laughs> Originally it had real meaning. Analyze every part. What value does it add? Can we get rid of it? And today we start value engineering after the first meeting. Well, that's not going to work. How do we just get rid of it? So anyway, same with roads. Uh, I thought this was interesting. I should have annotated it with one of the, uh, the references are listed at the end, but basically I think the author here makes a really good um, critical success factor for a road. Uh, what route should it take and what the location is, and what he means by that is what are the soil conditions I can take advantage of? In other words, if I can put the road anywhere within a you know, quarter mile stretch, which soil conditions are going to cost me the least to do? Um, how many uh, ancillary infrastructure types will I have to build and get rid of drainage and embankments? What kind of slope am I going to uh, uh, require? And I've got some numbers here. I hope you haven't seen them before. We're going to jump around a little bit because to make it interesting, uh, these books written in the late 1800s, uh, a lot of them were really treatises on uh, the subject. They, they weren't much for uh, a lot of illustrations and things. And uh, as you know, uh, was a McDonald with the uh, original U.S. Uh, Highway Department. He was a fanatic about the surface. Make the roads support only the load that it's going to carry so we don't overbuild stuff and pay a lot of money for roads we'll never actually use. <laughs> so I, I think this was a fascinating uh, graphic that I found where in the lower left corner, you're talking about the, the surface of the road, and then you're looking at the degree of uh, linearity to the road. And so one person kind of wandering doesn't need much. They're not putting much load on the, on the road. And then we look at it, animals and so on and so forth up to wheel, wheeled vehicles, basically saying by the time you're driving a car, you really need the road to be as uh, straight. Well, of course, there's downsides to that, but, but basically as efficient as possible. The profits of such improvements are not confined to the proprietors of a road, whether it be a town, a company, remunerated for the cost of building it, but are shared by all who avail themselves of the increased facilities, consumers and producers. And this, it now gets interesting. If we be worth in a city a dollar a bushel, and it costs 25 cents to transport it from a certain farm, then it will only be able to command 75 cents. Mm -hmm. If I improve the road and the cost of carriage is reduced to 10 cents, the surplus 15 cents on each bushel was so much absolute gain to the community. And you know, this is the kind of flowery writing that I think uh, you know, we, we've lost on, on some of our books. And it puts it in words we understand. You know? So I just took a couple of samples out of the book on um, the, the type of writing it is. Um, an ascending slope is then one in 20, and as will be hereafter proven, <coughs> one twentieth the whole load drawn over it in one direction must actually be lifted up the entire height in 100 feet. But upon such a slope, a horse can draw only one half as much as he can on a level road and two horses will be needed. <laughs> now, you say, well, what's this got to do with Lincoln? Don't forget, there's a, there's a tendency to look in a rear view mirror. 
you know, when, you, when you're doing engineering or anything else, because you got out of school, you get to a point where you're designing roads. So these manuals really kind of were still very much in the forefront of, of the design. On a well-made road of broken stone, a horse can draw three times as much as he can upon a gravel road. By making then such a road as the former in the place of the latter, the expenses of transportation will be reduced to one third of their former amount. So two thirds will be completely saved, and two out of three horses formerly employed can be dispensed with. Oh, well, okay. one thing I think the horse is one of that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All I can think of is like the TV show Car 54, you know, and like, uh, you know, they, they went from riding horses to driving around. Uh, so this is uh, the location and grades of country roads. The considerations which should govern the engineer in locating the line of an ordinary wagon road are the amount of traffic, its general character, whether light or heavy, convenience and necessity to the community, natural features over which it will pass, the labor, and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, basically just going back to those first tenants that we had on the other slide. When you build a road, what do you consider to do it most efficiently? So we all have probably seen at one time or another um, the, the earth, corduroy, plank roads, gravel roads. Um, I've got a slide coming up later, which is one, um, anybody familiar with charcoal roads? No. Nope. I wasn't. <laughs> so we'll learn together. And the interesting thing, too, is that uh, when I talked to some of you, uh, I wanted to get the engineering standards for the Lincoln Highway. And, you know, it's like, think of what you just said. There weren't any. <clears throat> they were all local standards, local states, local engineers having their own preferences, and they had a lot to choose from. So, quick overview of the types of roads that were popular at that time. Uh, we've got a Roman road up at the top. They only last thousands of years. <laughs> we have a French and an English system with the system which were very uh, similar to each other, but they basically depended on large stones at the base and a, a wearing layer at the top that could be replaced and maintained. And then Macadam on the bottom. What's the difference with Macadam? He said, if you prepare the subsoil properly, you don't need that layer of rocks there at the base. So it really improved the cost effectiveness of construction. Interestingly enough, some of the, I, I think it's the, uh, the uh, Telford roads, one of the interesting things about it was the road construction was great. It, it, it was curved, you had drainage and everything, but uh, I think it was in, or the French, I forget, that they wanted them built inside of ditches. Mm -hmm. So now the water drained off the side and then it just collected there. Mm -hmm. So a little, bit, uh, a little bit more detail that I found on uh, the construction technique. <clears throat> so in France, we had four classes of road, 66 feet wide, 22 feet in the middle or paved or stoned, uh, and so basically down to the, the lesser uh, traveled roads. The Telford Road we talked about, uh, 32 feet wide, uh, 28 feet of side cuttings, and 22 feet of, of uh, shoulder in areas that were dangerous. We might run off the road. Uh, what I, the Cumberland Road, 80 feet wide, of which the prepared, the, the finished surface was 30 feet. And the Romans only had to worry about chariots, so they, they were 12 feet. Opinions differ as to whether that portion of the carriageway to be finished and maintained as a dirt road should be in the middle or on the sides. Heavy loads are apt to seat the sides in order that the driver may walk upon the footpath which favors uh, meddling the wings rather than the middle. Yes, sir? I have a question about the width of the roads. When they, when they actually made the original road, were they, were they making it for the time, or were they making it in consideration of a later time that would, would maybe be more developed? Were they thinking like, we do this now, or we're actually doing this 
so that it'll be like this 20 years from now or whatever? You know, I, I think it's uh, just like with the technology we have today where, you know, you, you buy something and six months later you have buyer's remorse. <laughs> I think the change in technology at that time um, didn't give them much guidance. Um, I suspect, and I don't know if anybody researched this, I, I think to a certain degree the, the, the automobile was really kind of an iffy thing. I mean, maybe there was a lot of people who said, yes, at some point it's going to be, it's going to be sources completely. But when I read, it seemed that they really designed it to compromise and be both. Um, I don't think anybody at that time. But be, it, it's interesting. There's a fascinating book I've got on the, the, the uh, rate of change of technology and innovation. And uh, when you look at it, uh, how fast do you normally drive? Okay, there's no cops here, come on. <laughs> so the point is, how long have automobiles been driving 65? Not very long. Not very long. <coughs> anybody, uh, anybody ever get on a uh, uh, 707 aircraft? Yeah. How fast did you fly? Almost about 600 miles an hour. Get on an aircraft today, how fast do you fly? Still 600 miles an hour. So I think the road system was in that same bind. Mm -hmm. They knew they had to do something about accommodating cars, but I don't think anybody knew how fast they were going to go. I don't think, and, and there's a lot of engineering in these books on, on the radius and banking the curves and everything. Uh, but it's written in that flower that likes, like, if the road be banked to increase the force and so on. <laughs> so, um, I, I think it was a very difficult so, time for to, to design the roads because they didn't know how fast the technology would evolve. But they did do realignments, didn't they, at some point? Yes. 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 But the, the question, though, you asked was, did they plan for the road to get wider? The answer was no. In fact, it was only a decade or two ago, at least in New Jersey, it, it got to be the point where it, you, nowadays you can't build a bridge that's only two lanes wide. You're required by law to build a four-lane wide bridge unless you can get apply for special dispensation. It's the most, it's the first time in construction history we've shown any sense of planning ahead. They've just put a new viaduct by my house and it's, it was in a somewhat historic spot and they had to fight and fight to kind of compromise, but it is basically four lanes right because they don't want to have to build another one down the road. Yeah, that, that's yeah. great, Kurt, because if, if that was your question, I'm yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think they planned on shoulder widths or we have, we have a lot of roads here. We just drive up and down one of them, they never planned for anything. We could a lot of yes, sir. build right against the crowd. Can I can add something now that interesting? I, I wrote a lot of history about the George Washington Bridge, you know, when we celebrated the 75th anniversary about a decade ago. And what was really admirable about the George Washington Bridge is that it had extra capacity engineered into it from the start. When it first opened in 1931, uh, I think it was only open two lanes in each direction. The middle wasn't even filled in. And there was so little traffic on it, you know, you could actually carry on conversations across that gap. <laughs> and now, of course, the George Washington Bridge, you know, it had a second, you know, had a second level traffic added on it. They eventually filled in that gap. And then they added a second level of decking underneath it. Now, of course, it's the busiest bridge on the planet, traffic-wise. But of course, you know, things like that, you know, were rare. You know, pr primarily because also in the early days, you know, when there was an urgent demand to surface highways, it's like, okay, let's just let's just do what we can with the hastily adapted, you know, carriage road that we got. And, you know, we'll, we'll, kick the, we'll kick the capacity can down the road. Well, the, the GW was originally designed to carry the 8th Avenue subway. It's in New Jersey. Oh. And so <clears throat> what, the reason they could add the second deck is that had been engineered. And when they went to put the what we call Martha on the lower level, mm -hmm. um, all the attachment points were exactly where they were and were the right capacity uh, to hold the, the roadway. But they originally designed to bring the 8th Avenue subway into New Jersey. It's been a project we've talked about for forever. Mm -hmm. Speaking of knowing this group, if you continue with questions, you're never going to finish your presentation. Yes, I am. So can we hold questions till the end? I, I, I promise you I'll finish it. Okay. <laughs> um, but the same thing with the Brooklyn Bridge was over engineered to take uh, the trains. And so on. Yeah. Yes, sir. Same guy. Well, the same firm was involved with the National Road Bridge in Wheeling, and that bridge was designed just for carriages. They allow cars over it now, 
but there are uh, no trucks, there's weight limitation, and there's space requirements, 75 feet apart. So We saw that uh, space limitation by just driving right behind the bank. No. <laughs> <laughs> so here's some interesting numbers. I hope you haven't seen these before. But um, these are a uh, dynamometer was put and, and a wagon was dragged across a stone track and it only took uh, 12 and a half pounds of force to pull that wagon. It weighed uh, a ton, a long ton, 2,240 pounds. And a plank road was 80. And you get up here to an earth road, 200 pounds. So, you know, by improving the road surface through different uh, variations of improvement, you go from requiring, uh, you know, 200 pounds of pull to, uh, 12 pounds. So there, there goes your uh, uh, fuel economy if you're running a horse. <laughs> um, this was put a little differently, and I thought it was a great comparison out of another book. This is saying um, if I'm going to be running on asphalt, broken stone, and so on and so forth, what does it cost me per ton mile? So the railroad at a dollar twenty-eight and up to uh, you know sand, obviously not a very good road surface, at sixty-four dollars a ton mile. Uh, this was just um, you know you're, you're always dealing with moisture, and that's the enemy of a road and everything else. So you know it, it's going to get in there, freeze, fracture. Uh, I, I heard a, one of my professors talk about water being the uh, universal solvent. Suppose something to water long enough, it'll go away. <laughs> and so they, looking at granite, marble, limestone, and so on, and you look at the percentage of uh, water content, and uh, this will come into play on another, on another side, a slide. So here we have sandstone. And uh, looking at this, it's telling you that, and I, I assume, uh, oh, this is not the one with the uh, miles, but it's, it's got the strength. So as you go across the country, and you're in Wisconsin, Ohio, uh, Michigan, the strength of the building materials, they had varied quite a bit. So once again, we didn't have a universal formula that said this works <coughs> everywhere because the local building materials or building stone might not be appropriate for the loads to be carried. This is the uh, Production and value of sandstone for street use in 1889, and so you you look at something like um, California had uh, 100 cubic feet of sandstone streets at that time, and uh, then you get down to New York City, you know, two million eight hundred. <laughs> so certainly the adoption of a road surface varied, you know, depending on uh, of course need, but. Availability. And this is granite, uh, same same time period, looking at the, uh, I didn't realize granite varied that much. You know, you, you get Connecticut at 35,000 pounds per square inch worth of strength, and then you come down here to Maryland and it's 5,000. So hope that somebody probably made a lot of money creating testing labs at that time. And this is the uh, amount of granite in use. Again, California, interesting, must have been a local product, much more readily available than sandstone, uh, because here they've got uh, uh, three million square feet installed. <coughs> New Jersey at two million. Wisconsin, 1.2 million. A little bit more detail of how the granite was set in and held in place using concrete and a sand uh, cushion. The present system of paying for, oh, this I love, this is a great one. The present system of paying for granite block paving is erroneous. <laughs> the contractor buys his block at so much a thousand and sells them at so much a square yard installed. Thus, it is to his interest to have as few blocks to the square yard as possible and joints as large as he can. Or he may purchase them from the stone man at uh, so much a square yard. In this case, the stone man is interested in having as few blocks as possible. <laughs> as was also the contractor. For the fewer blocks laid to the yard, the more yards of paving will be done in one day. 
increasing the profits of the contractor. Mm -hmm. Nothing changes. <laughs> in some cases, the uh, paver is paid by the square yard for paving, then it becomes in his interest and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, as both of these are serious defects, the temptation to adopt them should be removed. <laughs> I don't know about you, but my barber's last name ends in a vowel. I'm not telling them to <laughs> So, um, granite pavement, 1890 in uh, miles. New York at 140 miles of granite paved roads. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, We've got some uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, 30 miles of roads paved with granite. Wood paving. Anybody worked in a factory, a manufacturing plant, and walked on wood blocks all day? My first job out of school was a GE, and I'd never seen it before, but you walk into the factory floor and it's black and you think, wow, that's really kind of cool, you know. And it's actually, um, I, don't, I don't remember what the species was, but it's actually blocks of wood about this tall that they put on top of the concrete to make it easier for people to walk on. And if something falls, they'll dent a little bit rather than... So um, they made roads out of wood, wood blocks. And this is interesting. What do you have to do to wood in order to make it last? have to preserve it. So if you're a cons conspiracy theory guy, kind of guy, in comparison of the death rate in cities using wood pavement with that of cities where little or no wood is employed, seems to show that wood pavements do not cause an increase in the death rate. Uh, the cost of preparing the different varieties of asphalt for pavement is nearly the same and as all appear to be about equally durable, the exclusive use of any one of them is due merely to the advantages of freight. This is asphalt pavement in 1890 across the country. Um, interesting, Buffalo, New York mm. is the winner. Omaha, Nebraska at 15 miles. Uh, what else have we got? Erie, Pennsylvania at five. Not a very popular um, paving method at, at that early stage. Omaha, Nebraska. Our temperature varies as much as 150 degrees Fahrenheit between the extremes. We are subject to rapid changes of temperature, which in the winter season occasionally as high as 60 degrees in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Douglas Street, which was paved in the fall of 1882 and the spring of 1883, has experienced a range of temperatures from 120 degrees in the summer to 34 mm -hmm. below in the winter. Mm -hmm. Our experience is very favorable to asphalt pavements on all grades. Uh, and then they talk about the slope and so on. Mm -hmm. Asphalt is not as cheap as wood, but in my opinion, a preferred pavement upon permanently established and well improved streets. Not quite as easy for the horses as wood, but more comfortable for those who ride and is clean and uh, superior from a sanitary standpoint. Mm -hmm. So how about brick? Seems relevant. <laughs> so um, Columbus, Ohio, 1890, 21 miles of brick road. Uh, Springfield, Illinois, one and a half miles of brick. Broken stone roads. Remember, we, we saw the different pavement and the traction if it required. So if you had a, a broken stone road, um, showing the variation. And the reason I put this in, it's local. You've got um, Linden, New Jersey, Plainfield, Broadway, Westfield, Union Township. And you look at the uh, thickness of the roadbed when you start getting into the heavy industrial area down there, 12 inches of thickness, 16 feet wide. What year? This is, uh, this is all 1890. But interesting, uh, nothing changes. Uh, Union Township costs you uh, $12,000 per mile. <laughs> and, and Linden is three. So uh, Broken Stone uh, Pavements, Principal Cities, 1890. 
what's fascinating to me is when, you know, our generation, when we grew up, the roads were paved. They may have been making them wider. I mean, they've never finished the Logan Expressway. You know, they never will. But um, it, it's just fascinating to see that uh, you've got St. Louis, Missouri, in this case, you know, 200, only 271 miles of, of uh, Stone Road. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is interesting because it's Jersey and we know where the bodies are buried. <laughs> Except for one. Yeah. <laughs> um, this method of drainage has been very successfully applied to reclaiming the Jersey Flats between the cities of Newark and Jersey City. A large tract of marshland with a natural surface not higher than the level of the ordinary high tide. These flats were formerly subject to twice daily outflow from the Passaic and Hackensack rivers in which the mean rise and fall of the tide was about four feet. <clears throat> The tract was surrounded by a dike or levee formed along the margin of the stream and the materials excavated from a wide open ditch. Numerous broad cross ditches divided the marsh and so on and so forth. Sluices are located at suitable intervals as to drain the main ditch into the river. The pipes are placed in pairs and so on and so forth, but the engineering is kind of interesting. A difference of one inch of water will open the flapper valve to let the water out. So apparently it did a pretty good job. And I may be out of sequence because I thought I had a beautiful <laughs> photograph of a flapper valve. But there's a, a lot of sections on drainage. You know, it's so important to the road is to get rid of that water and let it, uh, uh, get it away from where it's going to damage it by freezing and so on. And, um, you know, today we look at a culvert and we look at the drain and it's pre-manufactured. You get it, you know, put it, drop it down. But this is how you build them out of bricks, and they made bricks specifically for just laying them in the ground and forming the, uh, the drainage paths. Ah, there's my flapper valve right over here. The following are estimates of the cost per rod. I forget, anybody remember what a rod is? Say again? Okay. So, roughly, roughly, yeah, okay. Um, so it's believed to be fair with labor at $1.75 a day. Mm -hmm. And so they talk about how what it costs to put in the drain pipe and cost per rod 48 cents and so on and so forth and going from drain tile to, uh, to brick. One of my disappointments in making my presentation today was that um, uh, I get a number of civil engineering magazines, and one of them has a photo in the back every month of a um, legacy type of earth movie gear. So I called them, I got an email for the historian. It's been a year. I know he got my email. <laughs> Never returned my phone calls. I was hoping to have photographs you know, of the Lincoln Highway and the construction vehicles, but I just never got through to him. Okay, what's that? Roller. Roller, okay. <laughs> Pulled by horses. Work, yeah, works well, lasts a long time. That is a stone pressure. Now, for those of you who are wondering if you're going to buy a stone pressure, what you needed to look for, um, you want uh, a 200 revolutions per minute uh, requiring 4 to 12 horsepower motors and a uh, working capacity of three to seven cubic yards per hour of broken stone. The best size for breaking road material is one having a capacity of eight to nine inch thick stones at 14 to 15 inches wide. So obviously it's powerful, but I bet they didn't wear earplugs. <laughs> this was fascinating, this is a a uh, rotisserie type cement mixer. It, it had large doors, uh, two feet square, and you put your mix in and then your mortar and so on and sand, and then you just spun it around. Okay, that is a street sweeper. It was angled to push everything off to the side of the road. Now, there's a problem here. Anybody see what the problem is? What's going to be hauling the street sweeper? 
<laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> but the interesting thing was. Uh, the, the way this worked was they actually uh, drew it along the road and pushed all the debris and everything else to the side, and then apparently Prove too would come along with shovels and just scoop it all up and put it in the wagon and take it away. So, McCann <coughs> um, in Bath and Bristol in England, he did not allow any stone above three ounces in weight uh, to be used and he caused splinters and thin slices and spalls to be excluded as far as possible and laid considerably stress upon uniformity of the size of the material, perfect cleanliness, freedom of dust, or sand, or other earthy matter. The French engineers, to the contrary, were indifferent to such cleanliness. <laughs> so we said we had, we had, to, you know, we had competing road systems and uh, uh, Part of the French idea was that all this stuff is going to get in there, but it's not going to fill every void, so it really didn't hurt anything. I have a question. Macadam, is that the surface of the road, the style of the road? What? It, uh, it, it's the, I can go back to the other slide. Yeah, it's, it's the surface preparation, and his big claim to fame was that he got rid of those very heavy stones at the base. He proved that you could have a very well-wearing road just by having the subsoil uh, compacted properly. Because some places we had them is the surface of the road. They use that terminology. Absolutely, just like a, just like a Kleenex is any tissue. Exactly right. <coughs> what is tarmac? Say again. What is tarmac? I, I don't, all I know is it's not at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean seriously, you hear people talk about going out on the tarmac, and, and it's, it's not... Uh, I believe it's when they added the bituminous material to the mechanical mix, the, the rock mix that became that. Is that what it is when you... Tarmac, it's actually a brand name, and I have uh, ads for it for the Dixie Highway and the Lincoln Highway and uh -huh. different places where they... It was some sort of like asphalt type thing. Yeah, when, they, okay. yeah, when they add the, the, the asphalt volume. <laughs> Um, I think I knew about this, but it was fascinating. Shell roads? Mm -hmm. Florida, yeah. Florida. Oh, yeah. Florida. Yeah. Florida. South Atlantic and the Gulf Coast yeah. of the United States. Stone suitable for road coverings does not exist, and in most localities, good coarse gravel and pebbles cannot be found. Mm -hmm. Oyster shells, however, are generally from four to five cents per bushel, exclusive of the charge of getting them there. And when applied directly to sandy soil as a covering eight to ten inches deep, they form an excellent road for pleasure driving or light traffic. They wear much more rapidly, of course, than broken stone and gravel, and require constant maintenance. Charcoal roads. This was a total new one on me. The novel expedient of using charcoal for road coverings is not likely to be resorted to except in newly settled, heavily wooded areas where the standing timber has no market value and must be gotten rid of before the land can be used for agricultural purposes. A case in mention in Michigan where a good road was made through a swampy forest is the following. Timber from <coughs> six to 18 inches through is cut 24 feet long, piled lengthwise in the center of the road about five feet high, nine feet wide, and then covered with straw and earth, similar to a coal pit. Mm -hmm. The earth is required to cover the pile, take it from either side, leaves two good sized ditches and the timber, though not split, is easily charred. And when charred, the earth is removed to the side of the ditch, to the side ditches, the coal raked down to a width of 15 feet, leaving a two foot thick layer of, of charcoal in the center and the road is complete. The material is found to pack well, not form into ruts, doesn't get soft, spongy, although the water is not drained from the ditches. The cost is $660 per mile, and contracts for two of these roads were given out in Wisconsin at a cost of $499 and $520 per mile. Where suitable appliances labor at $2 a day, the natural American hydraulic cement at $1.50 or Portland cement at $4 a barrel, basically they're saying that um, a contractor per square yard can uh, turn out the uh, concrete highway at 270 to 280 uh, dollars. <laughs> 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 
nice us would be good. <laughs> it's interesting. I, I uh, ran an office for 10 years for a consulting firm, and we did uh, architectural acoustics and noise and vibration. And um, you know those sound barriers at the side of the road? Mm -hmm. Boy, could we save a lot of money by not putting them up. <laughs> in, in many cases, depending on the design, they, they are very psychological. Uh, the tire noise is a big issue. Yes? They were actually not for noise. They were uh, for areas where the exhaust fumes were spilling at the neighborhoods. So they were meant to have the cars churn in the air rather than have it spill into the neighborhoods. The noise thing was kind of a, a myth and a secondary selling point. Yeah, because they're, they're not very uh, emissions. We had one, one of our engineers was interviewed for uh, this old house or something. And, and it never made the TV show because <coughs> man speaks the truth. The, truth. <laughs> the guy looks at him and says, well, you know, we've got this heavy traffic over here and we've got this, so what should we do to uh, get rid of the, the noise from the street? And he goes, well, you build a wall about two feet thick and about ten feet high. <laughs> they, they actually just planted trees and told the audience, see, this will cut down. Well, that should be familiar to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's whatever your definition of ideal is. So this is the organization I was telling you about. If you want to go online and take a look at it, um, they, uh, they have a lot of reference materials. Uh, they also have a fascinating, one of the largest antique lock collections in the country. Antique lock. Locks. L-O-X. No. Uh, this is just, uh, you know, just a note um, about the, the, I want to give thanks to Google for doing that. It's just incredible to get those books downloaded. And that is the, uh, the cover of one of them. Another one. This is interesting. I, I bought this book uh, to research uh, the program. And I didn't do as much on concrete as I wanted to because you know the early construction it was a little iffy. But this book is fascinating. It explains why the Romans lasted 2,000 years. And what's really scary, and, it, and it's not a uh, uh, book to try to just uh, stir up trouble, why our buildings today are damn lucky if they last 100 years and our bridges last 30. And the secret word is rebar. Mm -hmm. Rebar has been the curse of reinforced concrete construction since it was first used. Uh, anyway, it, the book goes into a lot of detail on it. Things have changed, but uh, there were contractors at one time who used to leave all the rebar out so it would rust heavily because they thought it gave the concrete something better to grab onto. I don't know if uh, you're familiar with this book. I think I paid four bucks for it on eBay or something. But it's the assessment of uh, the roads in New Jersey and evaluated them for which ones should be designated as part of the, uh, I guess, the Stark Roads or Torres Roads, or I'm, I'm not sure exactly what designation it was going for. But uh, Lincoln, Lincoln Highway is part of that study. <laughs>